Part 1 of Climate Incorporated by George O. Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Climate Incorporated by George O. Smith. Read by Quartertone. Part 1. Chapter 1. Disabled Car. Patricia Morris drove through the countryside idly, but too fast for the time of year. It was late winter, and the road was slippery. Snow still lay damply on the ground, and there were ice floes on the lakes. But Patricia was not driving for fun. She was driving in anger and sheer boredom. She was sick and tired of all the surroundings of her home. Another person might have liked them, and Patricia had liked them once, but, like her life, they now seemed entirely too artificial. The daughter of the governor of the state is in a position to wonder about the honesty of those who importune her. Since she was mentally competent and physically attractive, she was quick to question the true, often hidden, desires of the men who sought after her. And so now, Patricia, filled with boredom, was driving too fast on a slippery road. And naturally, the inevitable happened. Patricia's car skidded on a slippery spot on the road and spun completely around twice. The car careened into the ditch against a light fence post and was still. A man, clad in a heavy overcoat, muffler, and overshoes, emerged from the woods, approached the car, and opened the door. Patricia, unconscious, fell from the car seat into the man's waiting arms. He shook her gently, rubbed her cheek with his hand, and murmured soothing words to her. She opened her eyes and looked up at him. What happened? You had an accident, he told her. You should not drive so fast on slippery roads. You might get hurt. Am I hurt? Forget it, he said, propping her back into her seat in the car. It's been fun. So saying, the man leaned forward and kissed Patricia full on the lips. Then he turned and left, heading across the road into the woods where he disappeared. He left nothing but the tingle of his caress. She swore softly in a cool contralto. Getting out of the car, she looked it over. The right front wheel was dished. The left fender was turned under against the wheel. Furthermore, no one without a tow truck could ever set that car on the road again for driving, even after it was repaired. Patricia kicked the wheel with a small overshoe and swore again. Then she laughed, and in the cool air her voice tinkled happily. Boredom? This time she had escaped it. From the glove compartment in the car, Patricia took a road map and spread it out over the hood. It was thirty miles to the nearest town along either way of the road. Through the woods, however, it was not far. A few miles. It was about noon, and the air was exhilarating and Patricia was well clothed. Somehow the idea of trudging along the hard concrete of the road seemed less fun than cutting through the woods. Getting lost didn't bother her. She wouldn't get lost. Using her nail file with sheer woman-like ability to work mechanical miracles, Patricia disconnected the little automobile compass fastened to the windshield and looked at it carefully. Die true, north-northeast, she said aloud. She blew out her breath and shrugged at the little white cloud. She'd be cold by then, but not frozen. What fun! Deep in the woods, the snow tapered off to nothing. The ground was not damp as with freshly melted snow, but dry. A duck pond a little farther on was clear, and not a spot of ice marred its surface. Ducks floated on its surface happily, fishing. The trees about her here were budding ever so slightly, and the grassy forest floor was truly showing the verdant green that marks the coming of spring. But it was still mid-March, and the awakening of spring not due for a full six weeks in this climate. Patricia continued on. Tiny leaves were visible here, and still further along there was the full-leaved tree, blossoming flower, and heavy grass of full summer. And then before her she saw a tall tower of girder and glass, surmounted by a three-foot sphere of mirror-shining metal. A comfortable brick building stood near the tower, and there was a few other small buildings handy. 
She stood there, wondering about all this, and definitely connecting the summery appearance of the place with the tower, for waves of warmth came from the shining metal sphere on top. She knew, because she could feel the warmth of her face as she looked up at it. Summery, isn't it? came a wry voice. Patricia gasped. A tall man stood behind her with a crooked smile on his face. A Doberman stood beside him, regarding Patricia with mingled suspicion and patience. "'I was blind,' replied the man without humour. "'These signs are printed in a fair grade of legible type in a good semantic form. They make no exceptions for personable young ladies, regardless of their desirability.' "'Don't be insulting,' snapped Patricia. "'I'd be a four-star liar if I told you that you weren't personable and desirable.' he told her acidly. You may be blind, but I am not. I'll leave your land at once, she answered in tart tones. I saw no signs. I know, he grinned. Your car skidded into the one you should have seen. Patricia bent a cold gaze upon him. You've been following me? Yes, and if you hadn't stumbled on this, you'd have gone on through without seeing anybody. What is the secret? she demanded. "'It's obvious, isn't it?' he told her. "'Seems to me that any secret project should have guards and a fence.' "'I can't afford either.' "'But,' faltered Patricia, waving a hand vaguely at the tower and the forest, "'but—' "'You've stumbled onto something that I'd have much preferred to keep secret, Miss Morris.' "'You know me?' she gasped. "'No. Just connected the license plate listing with the girl driving it.' And, she said loftily, is your name as secret as this project? He grinned at her again. Don't be snippy. For one thing, you didn't think my name important enough to ask. And for another thing, you're the trespasser, not I. Well? In an earlier era, he said with a smile, a man could hurl a trespasser into a dungeon keep, or set the dog on the trespasser. I'm James Tennis, Miss Morris and I'd not turn Doby here on you because I'd hate to see you trying to outrun a Doberman on those high-heeled overshoes. Instead, I'll invite you in for a spot of hot tea, after which I'll drive you to some place where you can arrange for transportation home. For which I'll thank you, Mr. Tennis. And this? This is my own project, he said, and it is not perfected and tested yet. I'll explain, but you must swear secrecy. "'That I promise,' she said with a lift of her head. He walked beside her toward the larger of the brick buildings. She noted with interest that he stood a full seven inches taller than she, and that he seemed more than sure of himself. The house itself was neat, but lacking in the frills and gadgets of a real home. It was starkly utilitarian and obviously womanless. Heavy drapes of the kind that require little attention hung over the windows, and in other ways the place had the appearance of a house where only the scantiest attention had been paid to those details which a woman considers important. Tennis led Patricia into the kitchen and set a kettle of water to boiling on an electric stove of modern design. Then he turned from the stove and conducted her back into the living room. Here he showed her a small metal case about eight by eight by ten inches. Atop the case was a tall glass insulator surmounted by a shining sphere. A standard line cord ran from the case. Tennis plugged it into the wall socket and snapped the single switch on the case. This is an effect I uncovered during some experiments, he explained. I know no more about it than I did two months ago when I first discovered it, but... He took her wrist and held her hand near the sphere. Warmth flowed from the sphere, and Patricia nodded. A smaller example of the larger one out there? This is the first one. That is the second. It was set in operation along about the middle of January. It seems to be doing fine. Patricia looked out at the green woods. That it does, she said. This thing, he told her, develops about the same thermal output as a 1,500-watt electric heater with an input of about 25 watts. "'It sounds as though you should be able to make a large fortune,' observed Patricia. "'It does,' he agreed. "'But I'm inclined to wait until I'm certain of what the devil is going on. It might be dangerous.' 
Why? Energy must come from somewhere, he said. The problem is where. Until I'm sure that nothing dangerous will take place, I'm not inclined to release it. You seem to have something that might well change the earth, she said. I'd like to be certain that the change will be all to the good, he answered with a laugh. Then he trotted off to the kitchen to take care of the tea kettle, which was beginning to make high-pitched noises. She followed him, and he served her as she sat on the tall stool in his kitchen. Chapter 2 Intruders The man on the road flagged the car down and climbed into the seat beside the driver as it came to a stop. "'That's her car, all right,' he said. Blackman nodded. "'It is.' Howardson smiled wryly. "'So what?' "'So we follow,' said Blackman. "'No look,' grumbled Howardson. "'No dame wrecks a car on purpose.' "'Naturally.' "'Then what's the use or sense in following her? We can't get nothing on her this way.' "'No, but you can never tell.' "'If she were headed for a love-nest or something, she wouldn't have to wreck a car to do it,' said Howardson. "'I admit it, but you can't tell what will happen. For instance, why did she head through the woods instead of walking along the road? You said she headed into the woods.' "'She did.' Her footprints point that way, but if you'll look on the map, it's thirty miles along Slippery Highway in either direction before you hit a town of any size. On the other hand, it's just a few miles through the woods to Redmond. I'd head that way. Yeah, admitted Blackman. And dear Patricia does like to ramble in the woods, we know. So we ramble too. Waste of time. Waste of time it may be, but we're making a living by following Patricia Morris for Hendy. And Charles Handy pays well. He'll pay even better when we can come up with something that will get Joseph Morris a political black eye. That's going to be hard. We know it. Morris is a clever, wise man. But Patricia is a young, headstrong woman. She'll slip sooner or later, and then the newspapers will take off on the entire Morris family. So now, we follow her. Parking the car, Blackman followed the footprints through the woods. Patricia's trail was easy to follow across the snow, and, like Patricia, the two men eventually came upon the edge of the cold weather and into the circle of warmth. Unlike Patricia, both men questioned this demarcation as faint as it was, and then they went more carefully, watching the signs of growing spring as they progressed. "'There's more to this than meets the eye,' snapped Blackman. "'Glad we came now?' "'I'll let you know later,' said Howardson." Through the trees they saw the buildings and the tall tower upon which was the shining ball. Now, said Howardson, I'm glad. Shh, admonished Blackman. Out of the door came Jim Tennis and Patricia Morris. I have no telephone, he was saying, so I'll have to drive you to Redmond. I don't mind, she returned cheerfully. From there I'll have someone come out and collect my car. And as soon as they do, he told her, I've got to replace that signpost you clipped. You never did tell me how you knew I was there, she said. That signpost contains a photocell unit, he explained with a smile. Dobie can almost read the signs, and he knows when the photo beam is broken. Well, Miss Morris, I must say that I am not sorry you dropped in. Too bad you had to wreck a car to do it, though. She faced him with a smile. The next time, she said firmly and honestly, I shall not wreck a car. He was a bit flustered and mumbled something unintelligible. Patricia entered his car, saying, There will be a next time, you know. He laughed happily as he climbed in beside her. They drove away, chatting animatedly. Blackman turned to Howardson. So? he asked. So this may turn into something. I'm a bit scared, though. Why? demanded Blackman. Look said Howardson. Supposing it gets out that Patricia Morris, the governor's daughter, is number one girlfriend of a scientist who has what it takes to create a summer resort out of a hunk of midwinter Minnesota. Blackman grunted. It wouldn't do Morris's chances for re-election any harm, would it? Nope. Unless, said Blackman slyly, someone else came up with it first. Someone who was a good firm friend of Charles Hendy. Someone, perhaps, who would not conceal it from the public, but would give it freely in the name of Charles Handy, public servant. 
Blackman took a vest pocket-sized camera out and made a few initial snaps. Then, with Howardson watching the road, Blackman entered both the house and the laboratory and took picture after picture of everything in sight, hoping that the batch there would be enough dope for a clever scientist to work on. It was a month later, about the middle of April, that Jim Tennis looked out of the laboratory window to see Patricia Morris come driving up the roadway. He went out and waved. She came to a sudden stop and smiled. Her smile was generous and neither sudden nor fleeting. "'It's warm,' she said, jumping out of the coop and shedding her fur. He stood there in shirt sleeves and smiled at her. "'Naturally it's warm here,' he agreed. "'I knew it would be,' she answered with a smile. "'So I dressed in a summer frock. Like?' Patricia paraded herself for him, a vision that left him trying to think of something to say that wouldn't sound idiotic. Elsie was frantic, Patricia went on. Elsie's my maid, and she is horrified at the idea of wearing summer silk in April. It isn't done, don't you know, she finished, imitating. Then she turned back to her coop and took out a basket. Furthermore, Joe thinks I'm crazy. Joe's that chef at the government mansion, and he never heard of packing a picnic basket in April. Now, she finished, you're going to relax. I am, he blurted. You are. You seldom do, I bet. We relax, he said with a final laugh. The Doberman came bounding up, and Patricia leaned back into the coop and produced a large and juicy bone. She tossed it, and Dobie watched the bone arch through the air, backed out of the way as it landed, and then flopped down with his chin on the top of the bone and looked at Jim. Jim nodded. Then the Doberman stood up and picked the bone between his jaws. He followed them, his tail wagging furiously. "'There was a lake,' said she. "'There was. It was warm and pleasant by the lake. Joe did well, too. In the basket was cold chicken, cold beer, and potato salad. The chef had also packed in a thermos full of boiling hot coffee.' Obviously, Joe did not quite believe the girl and was taking no chances. But disbelief was discounted because they used the coffee, too. That it was mid-April seemed unbelievable. It was too pleasant for that early in the spring, too warm and too fragrant, though from time to time there came a cool breeze from beyond the circle warmed by the radiant heat from the machine. And while they were lazing there by the lake, enjoying a summer day and getting acquainted, a more strenuous activity was going on behind them. Blackman had not been far behind as Patricia drove up to the roadway. The somewhat perplexed frown disappeared as her car approached Tennis's place. Then he nodded as though accepting the answer to a problem. "'What was that for?' asked Howardson. "'I couldn't quite figure out the reason for the picnic lunch, complete with cold beer and the trimmings. That dress she wore was strictly for August.' I'd almost forgotten about this place, and my mind hadn't quite accepted it yet. But now it's clear. Seems to me we should thank Patricia for her aid. Howardson grinned wolfishly. Yeah. Blackman was fumbling for some equipment. He took it out and approached the signposts at the off-jut of Tennis's Road from the main highway. When I get it set, he told Howardson, you drive through. They drove up to within a few hundred yards of the place, and then emerged. "'Is this safe?' asked Howardson. "'Yeah. Patricia is a looker, and Patricia is gone on that goon. It'll be moonbeams and daisies as long as she's here.' Howardson nodded dubiously. "'Betcha the Doberman isn't in love with her.' Blackman held up an atomizer. "'The Doberman will enjoy this if he comes snuffling at us,' he snarled. Blackman did not try the thing, which was just as well to Howardson. Then, armed with a list of items missed before, they went to work, being very careful to displace nothing nor to leave any signs of search. The minute camera came out again and again, and Howardson made some sketches and took some notes. They photographed page after page of Jim's notebook. Chapter 3 A Tower in the Sky down by the shore of a warm lake, Patricia was talking to Jim Tennis. "'But suppose someone comes in here?' she asked. 
Well, this isn't strictly a military secret, Tennis replied. After all, the best I can do is to discourage visitors. I cannot keep them out excepting by law. Furthermore, I doubt that anybody could duplicate it just by seeing the gear from the outside. As far as any further developments, no one can force me to disclose it. I've got a notice filed with the patent office on an electric heater, which I must complete by next November sometime. People seldom come through here, and those that do set off the photo alarm, and I intercept them long before they get to the warm circle. If they insist on walking through, I walk along with them, chatting furiously. We eventually swerve off to one side or the other, so that we bracket the circle. They come out on the opposite side, having seen nothing. I'd hate to see you lose out after all this work, she told him, and I can't help feeling that all this is far too loosely kept. It can be kept no other way, he said. A barbed wire fence of normal size would keep no one out. If it were adequate to keep people out, it would be large enough to create curiosity, and I'd have to go out and intercept them anyway. But am I the first to enter? asked Patricia. Not at all, he replied with a smile. Jones, who owns a farm not far this side of Redmond, was hunting for a lost dog once. He wandered into the circle before I could locate him. I started for the segment of photo beam he broke, and he continued to circle. And so he knows. He also knows that it is under test, and Jones is a closed-mouthed character. Too many people aren't. No, he agreed. But Jones is well-read, and his farming is done from a degree in agriculture which indicates that he understands science well enough to know that something that appears like a universal panacea on Tuesday may sprout horns on Friday and be more of a detriment than a blessing until it is well-tested. "'You've done well,' said Patricia. "'Them's fine words of praise, lady,' he grinned. "'I think they're deserved.' "'Quick judgment.' Patricia shook her head. Then she smiled and nodded. Yes and no, she said with a smile. Quick judgment based upon... Upon, he prompted. Jim, she said earnestly, do you think being the governor's daughter is a sinecure? It looks like nice work if you can get it, he laughed. It's a job of bending over backwards so that people won't think you're shoving too hard, she said with a trace of bitterness in her voice. Then Patricia leaned back on the picnic basket and looked up at the sky. That's why I like it here, she said. Light me a cigarette, Jim, and I'll tell you something. Jim smiled, lighted two cigarettes simultaneously, and leaning over, placed hers between her lips. I like it here, she said quietly, probably because I think it's the first place I've found in years where I can take off my shoes and be comfortable. Why, again? he asked, looking down at her. Jim, you're reasonably competent. I like to think so. When this thing is proved to your satisfaction, you know exactly what to do with it? Oh, but definitely. Patricia blew out a cloud of smoke, directing it away from his face. She said, I don't have to inspect everything you say and do for motives. In fact, she went on with a smile, rising on one elbow, an act that brought their faces very close together. I may have to entice you. This thing might be a very swell item for Dad's political future, you know. He chucked her under her chin. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, he told her. I must look up the competition. Huh? she asked with a slight perplexed frown. The opposition may have two beautiful daughters, he laughed. None, said Patricia with a smile. Um, then... Me? I'm going to wade, she said suddenly. She slipped off her shoes and stockings and stood up. I do not advise that, he told her with a slight grin. I seldom take advice, she laughed. She went forward and dangled one big toe into the lake. It was pleasant, and so Patricia stepped full into the water. There was a screech, and she retreated swiftly. My gosh, she spluttered, hopping around on the other foot. What's in there? That lake is stream-fed from the hills, he told her. This isn't really mid-August. This is still April in the rest of the country around here. Makes one forget, doesn't it? She said, dropping to the blanket again. Jim nodded. From his pocket, he took a large linen handkerchief and dried her foot. Patricia slipped back into shoes and stockings. 
One more cigarette, she asked, and then I must go home. He smiled regretfully. It was a shame to see such a fine day come to a close. What was that screech? said Blackman. I don't know. Sounded female to me. Nearly finished? Snake, probably, grunted Blackman. Yep. Okay. Then we leave, but quick. They'll be coming back now that some snake has invaded Eden. Making all haste, they packed up and left. When they reached town, they went directly to Hendy's office. Charles Hendy heard their report, then leaned back in his heavy desk chair and looked over the desk. And it's still going fine? he asked. Fine as silk, replied Blackman. Good. You keep on the trail. We're doing fine. Hendy grinned evilly. Not only will the public like Hendy for discovering this, he said, and giving it to them, but they will be rather irate at Morrison Company for having had it so long without mentioning it. But they won't. Hendy waved a newspaper. This is mine, he said expansively. This one will uncover the fact that Morris intended to keep his discovery secret until just before election. That'll fix Morris. What are we doing? asked Howardson. We are going to hustle, said Hendy. Out in the central part of Minnesota, a few weeks later, a vast tower reared skyward. Men swarmed the girders, riveting and welding. Up and up the tower went, reaching skyward as the weeks went by. A special high-tension line snaked across the countryside heading for the location, and construction workers built a medium-sized building at the foot of the tower. Skyward it went, and then at the top they started to weld together the segments that were the lower circle of a sphere. Rounder and more perfect grew the sphere as the weeks went by, and as it progressed toward completion more and more, men polished the outside until it was a mirror, smooth and silvery shining. Trucks of equipment came on a special trail. Only in such a remote location could such a thing be built. Only with great wealth could such a thing be financed. Up it went, with many people knowing about it, but not once were the proper authorities notified that the state of Minnesota was sprouting a metallic mushroom of Paul Bunyanian proportions. Hendy was a great fixer. Even the airlines were rerouted from the district, for they too observed the signs. The army believed it to be a navy proving station of some sort, and shunned it like the plague, while the navy thought it had to do with an army program and wouldn't have gone any closer to that section of Minnesota than they could have approached with the USS Minnesota itself. The Marines asked no questions. And so progressed the work, and the summer, and a romance. Jim could not leave his little garden, felt that it might be dangerous to leave. So Patricia came often, as the summer wore on, and the rest of the country reached a temperature known to Jim's garden spot since early spring. No longer was the lake cold, and Patricia climbed on top of a small tower and did a perfect backflip into the inviting waters of the lake. She came up blowing to smile at Jim when he turned from tending the fire to remark that she had displayed perfect form. Patricia felt amused, also, because they were toying with an open fire when there was the finest in electric stoves not more than an eighth of a mile from there, where the coffee would be brewed perfectly, where the hot dogs would not taste of smoke, and the potatoes not be filled with sand. But this was more fun. What? chuckled Patricia, looking around. No salt? No salt. Shucks. Shucks nothing. Me get. Stick around, Pat. Don't bother, she told him. But look, it's only a few yards. I can get it quickly. It's not important. Look, Pat, open fire baked potato might taste all right to you without salt, but not to me. And when I bring it back, I won't give you any. Yeah. Why bother? she insisted. Because, little one, it's no bother. He put a hand under her chin and lifted her face. He kissed it quickly but tenderly, then turned and started to dog-trot toward the main building of his cluster. In the house, Howardson saw him coming. Oh! yipped Howardson. Ho! Oh, demanded Blackman. Tennis! On the run! Let's get out of here! cried Blackman. Too late! He's in! 
Tennis came dashing into the house. He skidded to a stop. His eyes winked in disbelief. Finding the intruders flustered him. Oh, what's going on here? Tennis blurted out. Chapter 4 Conspiracy Charges Promptly, the pair headed for Tennis, Blackman high, Howardson low. Then they charged, and Jim, still shocked, struck back. They both hit him at one time, high and low, and all three went sprawling. On the bottom, Jim gouged outward, swung a mean elbow, and caught something soft and yielding. A fist hit him in the face. He kicked upward and hit something hard. A heavy blow caught him in the pit of the stomach, and simultaneously a flailing arm batted him across the ribs. They rolled free then, propelled by Jim's knees. On their feet, Howardson leapt and Jim ducked below the swinging fists. Blackman came down on the back of his head with a heavy fist, driving him down again. He turned over on the floor and kicked upward, catching Blackman in the solar plexus. Howardson kicked Jim in the side of the head, and the room reeled, darkly, mistily, and was all awry. The intruders wrenched themselves free. A loud bark cut into Jim's fading consciousness, and he struggled to his feet to watch Dobie make a quick leap for Howardson. Blackman turned and kicked the dog, tugging at his pocket. The Doberman turned on Blackman just as the man got the atomizer clear. There was a spray from the atomizer, and the dog shrank back, pawing at his face. Blackman and Howardson rushed out, heading toward the woods as Jim Tennis sank back onto the floor. He awoke with his head in Patricia's lap. Oh, what gives? he asked vaguely. I don't know, she said. I heard Dobie bark and an automobile take off. I came to find out what had happened. Who were they? he demanded. I don't know, she said. Jim Tennis staggered to his feet and went to the laboratory table. There was a penciled list of things to search for. The two men had left the miniature camera behind and some diagrams. Spies, Jim said, his head clearing. Spies? she asked in surprise. Spies, he said. Patricia, who were they? I wouldn't know, she said. It's possible that someone followed me. Oh, fine, he snapped. And if they've been doing that since last spring, they know plenty. Look, Jim, said Patricia, come on in with me. We'll see Dad. He'll know what to do. How about Dobie? asked Jim, running out of the house and approaching the dog. The odor of ammonia was still strong, and Jim Tennis swore revenge. You go, said Jim. I'll take care of Dobie. Patricia leapt into her coop, still dressed in dripping swimsuit. She drove like mad until she heard the whine of a motorcycle siren behind her. She pulled to a quick stop, smiling. Where's the fire, sister? said the motorcycle cop, stopping beside the coop. No fire, officer. Driver's license? In my other suit, she chuckled. Funny, isn't it? he demanded seriously. Not particularly. Look, officer, I'm Patricia Morris. This is an emergency, and if you give me a clearance to the governor's mansion, I'll see that you're rewarded. Is this a gag? No. Would I be entering the governor's house in a wet swimsuit for a gag? Might, but I'll take a chance. And so, having authority, Patricia drove the miles to the capital at high speed. As she headed into her father's house, leaving the officer to be congratulated by the wondering butler and the governor's secretary, she saw her father coming out of his office with a frown. Dad! she exploded. I've got to talk with you. It's important. Important, Patty? he asked absently. So is this. He held up a newspaper. On the front page was a huge picture of a tall tower surmounted by a glistening sphere. The headline said, Charles Hendy, philanthropist, supports weather control program. New device to bring summer weather all winter. Hendy offers service free. That, said Patricia, is what I want to tell you about. Three hours later, Governor Morris was shaking his head regretfully in Jim Tennis's laboratory. If I'd only known, he said, we could have protected you. But can't we do something? pleaded Patricia. Not much. Jim can file on his patent, of course, and there's no doubt that he will get it. 
but since it will be claimed that the sciences were developed simultaneously, Hendy will allege that he reduced the thing to practice before you received your patent. All you need is some evidence that they stole their ideas from you. Jim looked around. He shook his head. This notebook is meaningless, he said. There's a lot of listings and questions in it, but nothing that points to anything crooked. Nothing, anyway, that would show conspiracy, and they'd probably assert that they were my own questions and scribblings. The camera and film mean nothing, since anyone can expose film. The diagrams are definitely copied from mine. Fingerprints? Both men wore gloves. But on the camera and the booklet? There's just that chance, admitted Jim. Well, you hold tight, and I'll get the state's attorney working on the case. Hang it, young man. You'll get protection if I can give it as governor of the state. Patricia touched Jim's arm. My fault, she told him. He patted her hand. Couldn't have been helped, he said. And all we can do is to wait it out again. The door opened to admit the fingerprint expert from the state's attorney's office. Without a doubt, he said firmly, these are the fingerprints of Blackman and Howitson. I— Give me that statement, snapped Jim Tennis. He grabbed the sheet of paper from the fingerprint expert's hand, jumped in his car, and drove away at top speed. Tennis was halted at the door to Charles Hendy's office. The secretary spoke into the communicator, and shortly there was a reply telling Mr. Tennis to enter. Jim went in, loaded for bear. Hendy? he demanded. I am Charles Hendy. What can I do for you? Do you know men named Blackman and Howardson? I do. They are men who are performing a great service for the public. Well, I'm charging them with theft, breaking and entering, and trespass. Indeed. And why? I'm James Tennis. I am the inventor of the device you intend to use, the climate machine, as the newspapers call it. I've been under the impression that this machine was the invention of the men whose names you mentioned. They stole it from me. That is a grave charge, Mr. Tennis. Doubtless you have proof. Jim explained about the battle in his laboratory and the resulting collection of the evidence bearing their fingerprints. If this is true, it places an entirely different picture of the case, replied Hendy suavely. They are at the central plant now, unless they've fled, Mr. Tennis. However, I shall demand that they come here at once, which will take them until tomorrow morning. I suggest that you prepare your evidence and profess formal charges. We'll have a preliminary hearing before more is done with this case. I believe that Governor Morris and State's Attorney Jones are both very interested parties? Yes, said Jim Tennis carefully, but not so interested that justice will not be done. End of Part 1